for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. All right, here we go. You know, you know Nathaniel Jensen? He's the guy who... Um, Never heard of him. They're going to have a ball. <laughs> Never heard of him. He was in an after show with him. <laughs> I just want to point out, Aaron Ra is extremely irrelevant, outdated at this point. Um, probably why he won't debate or discuss these topics. So <laughs> we can see it here. For sure. Oh, man. Yeah, he's he's way behind. Jameson, when he was trying to get his um, his mutation rate, because right, he's he's basically looking at mitochondrial DNA and trying to prove that that mitochondrial Eve lived six thousand ish years ago. Yeah, I was reading a paper today that that called that and a what was it? it? It was some kind of egregious error. So she's talking about Dr. Jensen's mutation rate. He's talking about an entirely different thing. He doesn't even know what she's talking about. <laughs> One ear of the other, yeah. right over his head. Woo. Yeah, he goes, yeah, I read a paper today on mutation rates, and uh, they were wrong. Yeah, they just used some kind of an error. So I'll let him continue, but I just wanted to point that out, that he doesn't even know what she's talking about here. So <laughs> With Aaron Rod, you can just let him talk, and, and he'll dig his own hole. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I just wanted to point that out because he obviously has no idea what she's talking about. But he wanted to he wanted to bring up since she actually said a word he recognized, you know, mutation rates. He felt as though <laughs> yeah. I know what you're talking about. So, but he doesn't. I would love, and I'll go on. I would love to debate Aaron Ra in a timed rebuttal debate, extremely formal. You know, a couple 10 minute openings and then just like three to five minute timed responses. So he can't, because here's the problem with, with Arn. When his worldview is being destroyed or he hears something that he can't address, bam, he's going to interrupt. It would be so fun to demolish him in a timed rebuttal debate. And we tried to set that up, a few of us, and he, and he denied because. Uh, he's not interested in, in a sophisticated intellectual discussion. And just judging by this conversation, it would be bad for him. He'd have to retire, put it that way. Oh, yeah. I Praise even offered him um, to debate me, to pay. He paid him to debate me, remember? He said no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would be. Could you imagine just having free reign to just not worry, have to worry about him interrupting? And you got your five minutes to just throw out all the empirical data at him and watch as he can't address any of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like you said, though, he's irrelevant at this point. He's she is. Yeah. So yeah. that's he's he's irrelevant in what uh his technical knowledge is, but he's not irrelevant in the fact that he has a huge following of people that right. actually think he's relevant and smart. But he's not. So we're gonna pick him apart in this as well. Well actually it's a good it's a good thing you, you brought that up. So uh everybody in the audience can probably tell that we've really spent a lot of time on Dr. Dan, Erica, a lot of these critics. Oh, and what's funny is that they're a lot more intelligent and have a lot better arguments and put out better videos than who we are about to go attack. Because we're confident um and I'm sure everybody is just looking at our our last. Um, you can check our playlist section for refuting the critic series. Um, they've been significantly dealt with. We've had no real rebuttal response. So we're now moving on after this one. Since we're leaving no stone, stone unturned, we're going to hit them hard. Our, the Iron Raws, the Pelogias, Vice Rhino, Professor Stick, like all the big names, with the, and we're going to call them out. We're going to destroy their videos, and it's it's going to be fun. It's like the it's going to be just like how we went on to Kent's channel um, and destroyed the ERVs, debunking Pelogia. No response because they can't they can't take on educated arguments. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> we got a lot of things coming up. But here we go. Because yeah. it must be a range, the, the, the highest and lowest, you're supposed to get a moderate in the middle. And um, I, I can't remember the way they described it, but I remember just saying that they, they, they came up with a figure that if you do it really, really wrong, it could be so far off base as to be 6,000 years. Right. And and the problem was two, two very quick ones. One, to get his mutation right, he used dyads instead of triads, which you require a mother, a daughter, and a grandmother to get like an accurate germline mutation rate. 
Um, and if you have a dyad, it, it can always be somatic. You, you don't know for sure. Um, but more egregious is for his generation time, right? He needs a really short generation time, even with that completely off base mutation rate um, to fit it into 6,000 years. All right. Where to begin with this one? So I guess I'll just read from this quote right here real quick. Substitution rates among humans appear to be much higher rates than inferred from human chimpanzees comparison, which are the phylogenetic methods. So when she says, or he says, these uh, these rates don't line up. They, they have to be assumed. They have to, it, they're just mathematical errors. Well, unfortunately for them, the mathematical errors are so in favor of us that they want to point out that they don't match us, but they are so far from matching their model, it's ridiculous. Now let's move on here while I break this down for you, okay? Because she specifically mentioned two separate things. One she was mentioning, uh, he mentioned that the models don't do the math correctly. So let's look at actually how they did the math in a couple different ones. In humans, this yields a rate of about one mutation every 300 to 600 generations, or one every 6,000 to 12,000 years, assuming a generation of 20 years. This is the, uh, from a report, I would say in the late 90s that came out that was talking about the DNA, empty DNA and protein differences between all the great apes and their divergence rates. So this was their prediction. It would be very, 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 very slow. But that is not what we found. What we did find is this. How, and from pedigree studies, which is trio studies, remember her complaint was Jensen looked at dyads and not triads, and triads are trio studies, meaning three, three people. So how uh, was able to estimate that a, prob a mutation probability arose in the same woman born in 1861, yielding an overall divergence rate of one mutation every 25 to 40 generations. And he's talking about Parsons here. He said, both of our studies came to a remarkably similar conclusion. Those studies were published back in 1996 and ran to about 1998, 1999. But regardless, the mutation rate was exact opposite of what they actually predicted. Remember, they predicted one every 1,250 years or one mutation every what is it, 600 to 1,200 generations. It's the exact opposite anyway. So visually what we found is the exact opposite of what they did. Evolution predicted one every 300 to 600 generations. We found one every 33 to 40. So how did Parsons actually come up with that date? Like uh, he said, oh, if you make an error, it becomes that way. Not at all. Look, here's how he did it. Very simple. He took 133,000 years, which is when Stone King and Sherry here actually determined the last uh, bottleneck occurred. And then they he simply divided by 20, the fold difference between mutations rate that he actually obtained with Howell. Guess what? That came up to 6,500 years. So there was no error. There's no like low baseline and high baseline. He just did the math. He goes, well, if these people right here are correct and when the bottleneck occurred and I say the mutations rate is 20% faster than expected and then I just do the math, boom. That's it. Real simple. He didn't have to, he didn't have to do anything. <laughs> he, these people literally believe in evolution. They're not trying to get young earth creationist timelines. They just simply did the math and they got that as a time period. That's it. So Aaron doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. And Erica is talking about an entirely different subject. So this is fun. So we'll get, we'll go on now because we're going to get into what she was saying about the 15 generation or 15 year generation time, because she's making a point here. 15 is a generation time. He uses the lower end of a 30% figure as the universal for the entire technical paper. All right. Here's that technical paper. Since a 15-year generation time is at odds with the typical practices of today and in the West, my initial thoughts were to continue to favor the prediction that I had made previously. So that's why he used the 15 years. He made a prediction, and therefore he was testing his prediction with that that he made earlier. It wasn't that he, he he looked at the evidence and went, well, the evidence is going to line up to this generation time, so therefore I'm going to say that. No, his prediction was printed first. So let, let's go on here. Okay, here we go again. All right, so uh, empty DNA mutation rates and then converting the mutation rates 
by the ones per year demonstrating a hundred. Here's the, here's the important factor. 150 nucleotide differences could have arisen since the flood, assuming a generation time of 15 years. So we're going to look at that table in a minute. I just wanted to show you that 150 nucleotide differences is the maximum differences between all humans alive today. Okay, so that number is important. And then assuming the generation time of 15 years from his earlier prediction would uh, arise at this. So let's find out what happens when we actually download the table and we look at it. So what you're looking at here is that table. On the right is the total pre-flood and post-flood world. Okay, so if what you're looking at right here is 22. Now he predicted that up until the flood from Adam until Noah, about 22 nucleotide differences would have arisen in that population. And then boom, the flood hit. Then after that, the rest of the mutation nucleotide differences would have occurred. So using his generational time average of 15 uh, and going back to the flood, we have right around the average of what would be expected with the 115 nucleotide differences we see in the world today at the high end being here and the low end being down here. So his prediction was actually very, very close to being correct with, yes, using a average worldwide generation time of 15 years, which he predicted based on my, what I'll point to next. But let me back up in time. Um, the nucleotide differences weren't just between African people. The actual highest diversity of these 115s goes all the way down to the African San individual and an Asian Taiwanese Aboriginal. That was actually the biggest diversity that they could find. So that was the largest gap that they could find in all humanity. And so Again, using the date of the flood, which Answers in Genesis says was 4,350 years ago, he's obligated to stick at that rate because that's what Answers in Genesis says. If he was unburdened from Answers in Genesis time of the flood and actually pushed it back to a reasonable 4,500 up to about 4,900 years ago, he would have not had to... Yeah, well, he might even not have made a prediction around 15 years of age. He would have probably been able to use it 20 year age average because that is an actual more, I, I believe, relevant time of the flood. And therefore, the numbers would have been much easier to match. And also remember about these differences, they arise quicker in times of bottlenecks. What do we have in our model? We have two bottlenecks from creation and then at the flood, which would have also sped up these differences. Just throwing it out there. So. Here we go again. Let's let me go on because I am going to show you the next picture and you will see the chart on why Jensen actually used this rate. You can see he didn't just say, well, all here, I'm going to use the this time range because it's uh, I'm going to assume the ancestors did this. No, he actually chose. Uh, he he said this is what ancient ancestors did and it matches the data. And that's what we see even in Africa today. Small tribal populations look at the average rate of births. Most women, over 50%, have a child or two of them before they're even 18 years of age. So there it is. Real simple. You can see why he made the prediction. And now let's move on. Rational Mind ask, um, I have a question for Jason. Uh, you cite pedigree studies to get your mutation rate. In one of your papers, you mentioned that you can't be sure if you're getting uh, gametic or somatic mutations. In the book, you don't mention this important caveat. Why not? Good. So this is this is a very helpful question uh, for a number of reasons. One is if you Google like Jensen mutation rate, you'll come across the Filthy Monkey Men blog, where they basically imply I've confused. And Herman Hayes actually has a comment on that from April, re asking a question. You can see in there uh, where they say I'm confusing the somatic mutation rate with the germline mutation rate. So that. Really, what I'm detecting in mutation in, in these in this particular study. Let me back up for a sec. You can you can see this all documented in my papers, the references there, and get the primary literature. But one of the main studies uh, that I was using in this particular example was a massive study of Sardinians and their mitochondrial DNA, and I was deriving a mutation rate from that. Uh, and I and, and this filthy monkey man says Jensen missed this point. Well, actually, another example of people not reading what I write. <laughs> And so I appreciate the question because uh, it shows that this person's actually read the literature. So why didn't I why didn't I give that caveat in in the book itself? There's four reasons why. Number one, if you look again at the history of the papers I published, uh, there's there's been a, there's sort of two sets of mainstream mitochondrial pedigree mutation rate studies. The first set there's 
12 or more of them, I think. Look at the D loop. It's just a subset of the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, there, those are germline because they're looking at multi-generation pedigrees. You can look up all that literature. It's publicly available. Some of it's behind paywalls, but anyway, it's out there. And that gave a, a mutation rate. One mutation, it's, it's one times 10 to the minus fifth mutations, I think, per base per, per generation. The second set of mainstream papers looks at the entire mitochondrial genome. And there I took all the data and it came out basically the same, 0. 0.95 times 10 to the minus six. It's basically rounded to the same number. So there's across multiple studies, a strong agreement. Actually, there's five reasons I didn't get the caveat in the book. Uh, so the first one is there's agreement between these two sets. Second is, the paper wasn't aware of 2016, Mark Stone King's lab, one of the leaders in mitochondrial DNA. He's got a paper, I think it's Genome Research 2016, like 220 Dutch pedigrees. There he measures uh, the effective, he, he measures the mitochondrial bottleneck. And if you look at coalescent theory, you'll find out that the bottleneck size is equivalent to the population size. And there's a whole lot. So John Perry didn't get a chance to get into this last night, but actually what happens in mitochondrial DNA is there's a mutation, there's heteroplasmy that drifts to fixation. Anyway, you know, if, if you know the bottleneck size, that's, a, that's an indirect way of getting the mutation rate, and it gives basically the same answer as those other two. Thirdly, uh, or fourthly, whatever number I'm on now, this leads again to testable predictions about dating the transatlantic slave trade. That's basically a mutation rate free study. It's looking at branch length ratios, which is effectively a substitution rate measurement. This is giving, and it, it anyway, it'd be a whole other discussion presentation to discuss that. Hopefully, there'll be a paper that comes out this fall. Uh, but that's in agreement with it. Plus, lastly, and one of this, one of the things I point out in the comments, you can see one of the in, in the comments of that filthy monkey men study. Uh, in the book, I go through multiple other species that give a similar answer. So the fact that it gives consistent answers across these multiple independent data sets, it's leading to testable predictions that are working. That's given me confidence that, in fact, we probably are looking at germline. If you look at a family tree, and there it is. But let me back up because I forgot to mention something that's very, very important. And that is when you are looking at the nucleotide differences between all people, I want you to remember that 115 differences are all that we see. And when we're looking at the rates that match up and that actually show that the, the nucleotide different rates that are, are occurring and there are only that many of them, how come they are so close to our model, even if we have to use this unrealistic 15-year-old generation time, right? How come there's so few and how come it's so close to our model, yet so far from the evolutionary model? I mean, not far, completely off the grid far, like not even remotely in the same ballpark. It's like looking at an entirely different sport. That's how far off it is. Yet they're going to complain, oh, they used a 15-year generation time to come up with those numbers. Okay, so let's say he used an 18-year and it didn't really line up or it was, uh, it was lower. Well, remember, we still have a couple bottlenecks we could have resorted to, which he did not, probably in favor of evolution like he always does for some reason. I wouldn't. And, um, but yet that they're so far off from your model and yet that's completely neglected always neglected actually because it's like it's like stepping on nails and complaining that hey you're over there stepping on tax it's like hey you, hey, you got seven nails in your foot you're about to you're about to die over here from blood loss you know what i mean you're 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 focusing on the wrong thing look at how um how awful your model is doing because of this it's very very clear that the evidence is not on your side. Stop worrying about the little tiny problem on the creation side because there's definitely answers and that can be derived and given for these little discrepancies. There is no answer on your side for these discrepancies except for horrible rescuing devices. Anyway, let's move on. Where were we? We're about to hit up Carter right here. This guy's a beast. Let's do this. We probably are looking at germline. If you look at a family tree, Take two people who have the same great-great-grandmother and look at their mitochondria. How different are they? How many mutations do they have? It turns out there's, on average, one mutation about every other generation. That means that this tree is only a few hundred generations. That's exactly the time frame from Eve. The average human generation time is 30 years. If you take 6,000 years divided by 30, you get 200 generations. 
That's exactly right there. We're not struggling here to explain Eve. Eve is falling well within the realm of biblical probability. When we talk about hundreds of thousands of years, those are just evolutionary assumptions. They're not actually using measurable mutation rates. Look at the most common mitochondria in Europe, group H, V, and R. I have a group H mitochondria. About 80% of Western Europeans do also. But can you see these branches have different lengths? These people all have a common ancestor, yet this group has picked up twice as many mutations as their cousins. Wait a minute. If you can pick up more mutations in the same amount of time, you can't look at the number of mutations and know how old a branch is. That means that you cannot look between humans and chimpanzees and say, oh, they're X million years ago. It doesn't work like that. Their conclusions are being drawn from their assumption that humans and chimpanzees share a common ancestor. But when we look at it, everything falls into the biblical time frame and the biblical pattern. This is very strong evidence that the Bible actually is true. So the Bible claims there's one male ancestor and one female ancestor. That is not a requirement of evolutionary theory, but it is a requirement of the Bible, and it happens to be true. All right, so what do we know? We know that there are hardly any fixed differences between human populations on different continents, despite extensive adaptive divergence. So we know how many fixed mutations there are, and there's very, very, very few. The Bible also says we don't have common ancestry with chimpanzees. I'm looking at the, the mitochondrial data, and I don't see any evidence for it. I have looked at thousands, I mean, 50,000 mitochondrial genomes, and I have spent hours and days of my life lining them up and examining them on a computer. And I got them all there, and I've tried to add uh, chimpanzee mitochondria to that alignment, and I can't do it by eye. I can't say, oh, this piece matches this piece. It's obvious for humans. It's totally obvious. You try to add chimpanzee, it's like, it's like they're from Mars. They're so different, as if we really don't have a common ancestor. We've got you know, 7 billion people, and we all look different. How do you get that much differences in just a few thousand years? Well, actually, you as an individual, you carry about 3 million places in your DNA where the piece of DNA you got from your mother has a different letter than the piece you got from your father. So maybe mom gave you an A and dad gave you a T. Somewhere else, mom gave you C and dad gave you a G. Three million places, but there are only about 10 million common variants found across the world. That means you carry yourself about one third of the world's genetic diversity. And if you took a bunch of people with your ancestry, specific ancestry, maybe five or six or seven people, you probably have 95% of the world's diversity just in that small group of people. That means that we're all very close related. It would be easy to fit those 10 million variants in Adam. And the reason you only have 3 million is because your mother and father are more closely related than you might like to think because of inbreeding, because you haven't had the ability to marry people across the planet until just the last couple of decades. Trivial, but all the people in the world into Adam and Eve. Modern geneticists have been slow to admit that they can have Matt, pause that real quick. <clears throat> um, I'm just loving how you're destroying this, brother. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, can't wait to not see these points get addressed as usual. <laughs> but you see what he's saying there? So when we actually look, and, and this all goes back to the created heterozygosity hypothesis. <clears throat> I've explained this many times. It's beautifully consistent with our model. And as Dr. Carter is saying, we can look at all the people around the world and you heard it from him. There are only about 10 million variants, more or less, that are found. These are the ones that are very common and they are not disease causing for the most part. Okay, of course, we're living in a fallen world. Now, would we call these mutations as the evolutionists would assume? The evolutionist assumes that all DNA differences are the result of mutations over time, which we know is impossible due to the deleterious nature of mutations due to their hypothetical out of Africa scenario. So these could have most certainly been the variants that God engineered into Adam. And that's all that would have been 
needed. Just like uh, Dr. Carter there iterated, you and I have about 3 million places, okay, where the copy, as he said, that we got from our mother differs from the copy that we got from our father. Therefore, we carry a, a, by ourselves in our own genetics, 3 million differences. It's not a huge stretch to simply say that Adam carried 10 million. Okay. And therefore, because we only carry a subset of the world's diversity, of course, if we have 3 million, roughly put the world's diversity into Adam and over time, these genetic variants spread out. Those 10 million variants are actually found all over China. We find them all over Europe, all over Africa, all over the entire world. The question is, why is this? Well, it's because these variants were in our population, obviously, before we spread out, which means those variants were on the ark. And ultimately, that means they were an atom. This isn't complicated. The evolutionists don't read our literature. You can find this in technical papers from Carter, Sanford, obviously, um, Jensen. All of this is perfectly consistent with allele frequencies around the world, why chromosomes are geographically specific. There's no ancient divergent Y chromosome. Same with the mitochondrial DNA. Incredibly low variation in Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. You even heard it from Carter there when he adds in chimpanzee mitochondrial DNA. It doesn't make sense. It's all a mess. And isn't it funny how this is perfectly consistent with our model, okay? But the evolutionist has to assume some type of near extinction event 70,000 years ago in Africa. That's not even remotely feasible given the fact that all of these deleterious mutations that have been accumulating for generations and generations are now going to come to the forefront. They're going to be manifested and they're going to lead to rapid accelerated genetic degeneration. So I, it, what Carter is saying here, guys, you know, pay attention. I'm trying to break it down too, but it's fascinating stuff. So can't avoid it anymore. This is Luis Quintana Mercy. He's a famous geneticist. He says, "Oh, we need a big word, phenotypic." Ooh, big word. Um, you remember in high school biology, you learned phenotype and genotype. Genotype is the genes you carry. Phenotype is the way you look. And the reason it is a difference is because you might be carrying a recessive gene. That might be overwhelmed by a dominant gene. So even though you're carrying that gene, you can't see it. See, I have brown eyes. I have four children. Three of my children have blue eyes. So obviously I'm carrying genetically the blue eye trait, but phenotypically I have brown eyes. Genotype versus phenotype. The genes that explain the phenotypic differences between populations, the way people look, only represent a tiny part of our genome. Confirming once again, the concept of race from a genetic standpoint has been abolished. All of those things that Darwin and his disciples and their descendants wrote for 150 years has been destroyed by modern genetics. We are one species, one people, and we're all very closely related, just like the Bible says. Uh, I spent more time pretending to be learned than actually oh. learning. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> so if we were not genetically related to the great apes, we wouldn't even be able to attempt it. <laughs> it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Sorry to use that word, but what does that mean about know, who, who wrote this script for him? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's right now yeah <laughs> so does that mean that these chickens that also didn't split from the great apes couldn't have their mutation rate checked by pedigree studies yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh and what's funny is these guys are not doing it impromptu like us where we just jump in watch the video say what's on our mind kind of thing go on rabbit trails i mean he's literally writing a script and he's sounding ridiculous i know yeah it's so bad for him I mean, look at what they had to resort to when they found that the molecular clocks, there's only a certain amount of mutations. They only, they go, well, uh, they only seem to go back about 200, 400 generations. <laughs> Ironic. <laughs> Just, so oh, no. Just so happens. What a, coinc what yeah. a coincidence. 
Exactly. Here's another one. Look at this. Right back to the flood. Oh, and here's another one. I really like this chart because this shows you what he's talking about. All of these round circles are phylogeny based mutation rate. These gray lines are errors for margin or margins for error, I should say. And they this is how what they allow for discrepancies up here. This is the actual observed pedigree mutation rates, all of them put together, including ones that obtained zero substitutions. So every single one that they could compile together, pull together, bad studies and good studies are way up here in the actual range. And then all the nonsense is down here. Look at that. Reality, fake. What a difference, I tell you. Anyway, let's keep going. So, for example, this is what many people don't realize, even evolutionists don't realize. We have in, our, in all of our cells, with few exceptions, DNA, and every generation, sperm and egg pass on DNA. The DNA changes. There's mistakes that happen. We live in an imperfect world. It's not copied perfectly. Well, that means it's a, it's a regular process. And so to have a clock, all you need is a regular repeating process. Every generation, changes happen. Oh, so it's molecular clock dating that even a lot of evolutionists are unaware of. You may be right, but as I said, molecular clock dating relies on common ancestry in order to work. In fact, to get it to work, you need to first have a pretty well-established date for a speciation event in order to calibrate it. So did you just say what you mean? More yes. assumptions. There's the circular reasoning again. Yeah. He doesn't even realize that he's so indoctrinated. Yeah. So we have to we have to calibrate now with the assumed geological column and the dates associated with it. Well, guess what? These accurate predictions that are coming out from the creation side is not based on assuming the deep time in the geological column. We're looking at the empirical rate and we're making testable predictions based on the empirical rate and the empirical method. But he's admitting, what, two, three times? And it's funny because he hasn't dealt with us yet. So he's just digging himself into a, a hole that he's never going to be able to climb out of. But it's assumption, assumption. That's why he won't come back with future novel testable predictions. The best that they've come up with was from damage control, Dan, Dan, the pseudoscience man, that we completely exposed as a non-novel prediction. <laughs> so good luck, bud. Yeah, exactly. And what's funny <laughs> too, is he literally admitted that humans speciated when humans have never speciated. So I find that funny. But here we go. Yeah for a speciation event in order to calibrate it. So when we use a molecular clock to figure out when humans migrated out of Africa, we first have to plug in the date of our divergence from the chimpanzee lineage in order to calibrate the clock. What's always fun about molecular clocks is there are actually a lot of issues with it, way more than any of the issues that creationists like to bring up for radiometric dating. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you every single one of these studies to show you he doesn't know what he's talking about. And what we're looking at here is we're talking about uh, one or two mutations after eight generations or di uh, we could just call it. Uh, yeah, that's called generation times. So this would work out to be one out of 44. And so what this means is these are substitutions. And this is what the mutation rate is actually based on because this is what matters the most when we're looking at differences in people. So we're going to start with Howell in 96. And then we're going to go to uh, Bindal and then Mum and then Parsons. We're going to go down each one right now. I'm going to show you what I'm going to show you. Explain these things for you real quick. So here's the first one. It was uh, how he obtained one mutation every 25 generations. Okay. That was the first one done. And this study was probably in 1996. And then 1996, again, Ben Dahl came out. He got four out of 360, which works out to be it's a bit different. Uh, one, one in 90. Perfect. Yeah. One out of 90. So different but the reason why is you can see it right here the, oh i'm sorry um let me just rewind a little bit i keep having trouble okay ah i don't think i got it it's very hard to rewind on this thing there we go he looked at the hyper variable region one when you look at only one region, you're never going to see all of the substitutions that are occurring or all the mutations, I should say. So these substitutions that are occurring need to be looked at in the entire control region. So he looked inside the entire or she looked inside the um, control region and only looked at one of the 
regions inside of that region and then only looked at part of the segment of that region. So she only collected a small fraction of what was seen and it looks like it's slower because of that. So here's the actual study and as I mentioned, and they reported two out of 170, which basically worked out to be that. Um, Pendal assumed that one half of the heteroplasmic mutations detected in their pedigree analysis would not become homeoplastic for their new alleles. That assumption, however, is not supported by any experimental evidence. So what they assumed to be true was later found out to be wrong, which again slowed down the mutation rate clock in that study. That's why they got it so different. Their approach used will not capture newly arising heteroplasmic mutations. Who's allele? So what does that mean? Heteroplasmic mutations speed the mutation rate clock up because you're seeing diversity. You're, cle you're catching and looking at all the different mu um, mitochondria that's in a single human being and you're, you're accounting for them. You're calculating up their mutations that are building up or I should say their substitution. Here's what this looks like. So here's the entire mitochondria. And what they do is they go to right here. This is the control region. It's also known as the D loop. They go over to the hypervariable region one and they go right here. It's about this many base pairs long and it's a little bit larger than a hypervariable segment two or hypervariable region they call it different things it's a little bit smaller but because of the larger size it also is faster than the hypervariables uh, region two so when you're only looking at one you're only seeing half the mutations that are in this region so when you're looking for an accurate mutation rate you have to look at the actual segment that's co that's collecting them or else you're not going to see them all that's why different studies obtain different rates. It's because most of the time, these studies are not originally trying to gather a mutation rate. They are, uh, they are doing it for another reason. They're either looking at family relations. They're looking for heteroplasmic disease. And it's secondarily looking at a mutation rate. So here's the biggest problem is they pull all these studies together. And then they say, well, look at the mutation rate clock. Let's see what it comes out to be. Well, that's stupid. That's like um, comparing apples and oranges. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to look at what's accurate, and most studies aren't actually trying to do that. Parsons was, and he's next. So, but before we get to him, look, another study, a little bit higher on the rate. Again, um, not, not low, but not high either. Doesn't even come near what evolutionists need. And again, what do we see? One region, one segment, and a part of the segment of the hypervariable region one not collecting the entire full data yet again. Why? The study was not designed or intended to investigate mutation rates. It was designed to verify that two family members were related. Then, like Mom and Bendal here, they only looked at the one region. That's the problem. So again, we have another study that didn't try to get a mutation rate. They were doing something else and then they obtained a mutation rate. So what did they do? Well, the scientists came along later and they said, well, let's pull it together because they have a mutation rate. Stupid. Let's go on to Parsons now. Oh, look at this. He tested both like you're supposed to do. What did he get? Oh, look at that. Only one out of every 32 generations of mutation rate. Well, how many substitution fixations are there? Remember, 24 in total. Multiply that sometime. What are you getting here? That's the real answer right there. Hey, Matt, look at... Uh... Look at Ian Chen. So I'm going to answer one question that he had because he, he said he's not familiar with any predictions yet. So we'll explain. It, I mean, how funny is that? But he also said this, Matt. <clears throat> SFT made me read the papers on this. One of the criticisms on Jensen is he uses the D-loop and extrapolates to the entire mtDNA. What do you say to that, brother? That is because the entire mitochondria – uh, it does mutate, but it's a little bit different, but it doesn't matter because they all converge on each other. You can go inside the entire mitochondria and pull out one of the 37 genes and test them for mutation rate. And again, they, they show the exact same consistency. So it really doesn't matter where you look, but the D loop right. makes the most sense to study because of its size. You don't have to study a 16,569 base pair region. You are literally looking at that little tiny segment of base pairs and it collects the same amount of, of, of information. So why would you waste your time looking at a higher region that's going to give you the same results? That's why. So I hope that See, and it's funny how he, well, it, it, oh, it answers it. It's been answered. And what's funny is I gave him a really, really deta detailed response maybe a week ago from um, actually from Jensen himself. 
who talks about all of the numbers of studies, not one, not two, not three, not four. I mean, a number of studies that have been published that are all consistent, all consistent um, across multiple independent scientific studies. And yet he didn't even um, deal with it. And also I pointed out the fact that he didn't give any answer. Um, why does mitochondrial DNA clock in humans point to a young genome and reject millions of years time scale, but also in many other species where the mitochondrial DNA has actually been measured. For example, the fruit fly, roundworm, water flea, yeast, all of these mitochondrial DNA mutation rates all strongly corroborate on one key answer and conclusion. And then all of this data leading to testable predictions on the history of civilization, which I just explained in detail. And I've explained, he said he just got here. So, you know, that's no excuse because I've explained it in detail over and over again in the fact that Ian, you know, well, make sure you're listening. If this is indeed true, that for the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA, that the DNA differences that we see, okay, mitochondrial DNA mutates fast. This is given. There's not a lot of mutations when you look at it visually in a phylogenetic tree. I mean, the average person is roughly 20, 25 mutations apart from the mitochondrial DNA sequence. Most is about 100, 120. Easily explained in 6,500 years. Ian, you're in the comments section right now. And this is good because we're just going to destroy objections that Vice Rhino, well, Vice Rhino doesn't seem educated enough to have any rebuttal. So, but uh, Ian, how are you going to explain such little differences in the mitochondrial DNA to account for your 100 to 200,000 year data? I mean, pull out the storyboard there, buddy. But um, <laughs> when it comes to the history of civilization. That's what I love, the Y chromosome dissimilarity, trying to explain how you can get so few DNA differences, yet the mitochondrial DNA mutates fast. Ian, anytime, anytime my man, I'll give you the link. You come in here and you uh, defend your position, but I wanna know, detailed story. I've discussed it with CRISPR and you should have seen his storyboard. He should win awards for it in order to, um, account for why there are so few differences. But here's the thing that Ian always forgets, the history of civilization. If these DNA differences, which are a marker of time, only go back 4,500 years for the Y chromosome and 6,000 to 6,500 years for the mtDNA, then we should be able to detect genetic signatures, okay? Testable predictions have been made. A new Y chromosome paper has recently come out suggesting that genetic signatures have been detected in the Y chromosome. If deep time evolution is true and the DNA differences in the Y chromosome are a reflection of 200,000 years, it should be nothing but noise, okay? There should be no detectable signal. Ian, why is there a signal detected? And why aren't evolutionists making predictions on DNA stamps and genetic signatures in the Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA? Answer it right now. He won't, he won't, but go ahead. And then also, and actually, George, you can touch on this one too. We can get into we can get into genetic, uh, we can get into DNA function related predictions. I asked him in the chat just now. I said, Ian, reiterate to me the prediction on um, cytochrome C and these highly highly conserved mitochondrial DNA proteins that Jensen is making regarding nested hierarchical patterns. Do they reflect design or do they reflect descent? Uh, Jenkins got a number of DNA related predictions. Let's see if he can reiterate it. I predict not. Another one, geology. George, if you want, you could touch on this too. This one's been confirmed. One of the predictions of catastrophic plate tectonics, right? The fountains of the great deep break open, plates are moving, uh, moving vertically, horizontally, catastrophic process is taking place. Therefore, if these plates are being pushed down, okay, they haven't had time to melt. Dr. John Baumgartner, a geophysicist, okay, a geophysicist who's published numerous secular papers. Ian, how many have you published? Ian, answer this question. He made a prediction that if this is true, okay, we should find huge slabs of cold rock at the base of the mantle, okay, because they would not have had time to melt yet. Then, years later, this new field of science comes out. It's called seismic tomography. With this new form of science, what did we learn? 
lo and behold, we learned that massive slabs of cold slabs of rock are at the base of the mantle, which means they've been pushed down there recently and have not melted. This is just one of the many predictions that have confirmed the global flood model. Rapid magnetic reversals was predicted by um, Russell Humphreys. That came true as well. So uh, how do you explain that data there, Ian? And uh, I understand why you don't jump into these live streams because I would make you look like um, you know, how, uh, sillier than you look in the comment section. So it's just, it, it's irritating because explaining the same things over and over again to atheists who say they watch our channel all the time, but they can't reiterate a simple prediction. I mean, I just went nonstop in one breath and named what, four or five predictions? You want me to name 10? Like these guys got to start listening. I don't know what's... Well, they, what's they're, complaining, they're complaining that we're using the, uh, the, the mitochondria. It's like, no, evolutionists are using the mitochondria. What are you talking about? They're the ones that found it to be the best. So you're complaining that your own people are using a molecular clock that discovered mutation rates and beneficial benefit of us, and then you're mad at us for it. That's insanity. First of all, why do they use the mitochondria for a testing area? Well, it doesn't repair itself. It's like trying to test muscle to determine how old you are. It's stupid because it would repair itself and you wouldn't get accuracy. But because the mitochondria doesn't repair itself, it makes the perfect area to test. It's not because it's fast. It just happened to be fast because mutation rates are fast, and that's the reality of thing it's true and they can't they can't say oh well why don't you test another region well for the very reason that it repairs itself they found a control region inside the mitochondria that was the most accurate to test because it's small it's quick and it's cheap rather than testing the entire mitochondria which is more expensive and gives you the same results and guess what it doesn't repair itself and it's extremely fast that's why they use it that's why we use it so by uh, uh, to us you're complaining about yourself yeah, I'm not if I'm not sure if um, you're going to cover the section of that video on uh, predictions, but either the, either these guys don't do their homework or they're being totally dishonest and disingenuous because they talked about predictions, but yet if they read if they read Dr. Jensen's papers and especially his book Replacing Darwin, there's heaps of predictions in there. So so it's it's either being dishonest or disingenuous or or just being idiotic and not doing their homework. I know. It's, well, here's yeah. the issue too, is a lot of them are very technical. Like this history of civilization prediction, I I had to study, like I've read Replacing Darwin thoroughly. I had to study it. I had to look at all these phylogenetic trees. I had to read through Jensen's papers. It, th these predictions are oftentimes not easy to even explain. I mean, he's got an active research program where he's, I imagine, is doing it full time. So, you know, when you explain it over and over again, eventually you kind of just hope that the critic, if they're really uh, genuine, they will go and pick up replacing Darwin or by some other means go study the prediction themselves. You know what I mean, George? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you, me you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned radiometric dating there. Yeah. As one of the um, methods to to show evolution, but I'm not sure whether you want to touch up on that, whether you want to move on yeah. to the next uh, argument. Yeah, George, if, if if you wanted to, well, I guess Matt, if you want to finish with the uh, no, with what you're yeah. saying, and then George, and uh, George, I want you to take some. George, I'd love to for you to. Um, you wrote a section on on diamonds, which was phenomenal. Did you want to touch on that uh, specific topic? Well, I was just going to bring up a section. So, so I'm not accused of uh, misrepresenting here. It comes straight from the National Nuclear Security Commission. They, they state uh, secondary deposits form due to the leaching of uranium from minerals during chemical weathering. Uranium is mobile in groundwater, but is readily precipitated by humic acids in soils. It may be found in carbonized plant or animal remains and may also fill openings in porous soils. So straight off the bat, you can see that radiometric dating is subject to contamination purely via, via the movement of groundwater. So that's, that's why I, I, I tell people I don't trust any radiometric dating uh, that's, that's done because, uh, because of that problem. And, and the classic example is the stuff up at the KBS Tuff. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of the KBS Tuff. Yeah. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's all I wanted to say on radiometric dating, but it's it's a whole subject altogether, and and I know uh, SFT has has covered it on on a, a separate video to this, uh, and it, and it was very well done, by the way. Oh yeah. Yeah, we touch on the subject a lot because that's one of their main arguments when it goes to how old the th things are. You know, they, they're, they're quick to say evolution only has to do with biology. And then you go, what's your best evidence? They go, radiometric dating. <laughs> well, so. I'll, I'll, I'll cover carbon-14 in diamonds uh, at, towards the end, if you like. Right. I don't want to interrupt uh, the rest of the video. So keep, keep, keep uh, rolling the video, I guess. Okay, uh, I'll finish up here. I'm still going on. I kind of go on a tangent here because a lot of this section was on molecular clocks. So yeah, take your time, Matt. Just it, it hit it hard, brother. Leave no stone unturned. Okay, as we're working our way through these studies, we finally got into 1997, where this is Parsons now, and he came along and he decided I'm going to only do a study based on mutation rates, and I'm not going to use and assume. Um, you know, evolution, even though he does in his mathematical calculations, he didn't, he, he still looked at the observable mutation rate. So this was really good because he used massive amounts of studies and he got 10 mutations every 327 transmissions. And uh, we're going to look up, oh, I'm sorry. One second. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and, um, Sorry about that. Sidetracked the baby. Uh, all right, here, let me hit play. Okay, here we go. We see it right here. One in 33 generations. You Assuming a generation time of 20 years gave him his mutation rate, and that is where we get the 6,500-year time frame from. But creationists usually don't like to poke too many holes in molecular clock dating because of that one article that used a faster-than-expected result for mitochondrial DNA mutation rates to calculate mitochondrial Eve's date at 6,000 years ago, right before explaining how that's not actually possible. But what creationists won't tell you is that even if that 6,000-year number was correct, it was arrived at based on the assumption of our common ancestor with chimps living about six to seven million years ago. <laughs> uh, so how did Parsons come up with that date? Again, he even used evolution uh, to help in his calculations. I wrote it right here. And what did he do? Well, I talked about it earlier. He used, at the time, the most recent common ancestor from a bottleneck, came 133,000 years ago, divided by 20%, got boom, got his date. That's it. Real simple. Mitochondrial Eve likely lived between 99,000 and 148,000 years ago. Well, I like this because this shows you the reality between the different two. Uh, we haven't gone through all the studies yet, but I threw this in just so you can see. What is he talking about? Wh which one of these studies is he going to go by? This one? This one? This one? <laughs> you know what I mean? The dates are all over the place. All over the place. Look at this one. Up to 300,000. Look at this one. Down to 72. That's accurate. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, looks like I put that one in before. Oh, here, read this one real quick with me. For example, researchers have calculated that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose empty DNA was ancestral to all living people, lived 100,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa. Using the new date, she'd be a mere 6,000 years old. Now, read the bottom. No one thinks that this is the case. But at what point should our models switch from mutational mtDNA time zones to otherwise? I'm worried. They're worried about it. You know why? Because reality is a horrible thing, isn't it, guys? The truth hurts. Now, remember when he said nobody agrees with this study? Well, here's one for you. They completely agreed with each other. So, so much for that one. Both of our studies and his, this is Hal talking, got the same results. They got 25 uh, to 40 mutations. Here's another one. Look at this one. Notice something? They, you, they looked at both regions and got zero mutations after 108 generations. That's odd, isn't it? No mutations. Let's see what they got from it, though. Though they didn't see any occur, the reason why is because they were studying in a, a particular family that had no mutations going on between it. So they used one mutation every 36 transmission events to go along with the probability and got their actual mutation rate from this. And this is what we saw the, from the number of families. They only looked at five families. 
and they were related, so they didn't see any mutations because they were highly deleterious and they were selected against and removed because that's what happens to really harmful mutations. Uh, and uh, you don't see any substitutions that way. So they got theirs and look at this, look at the consistency. Oh, everything's very, very consistent, but let's continue on. Okay, uh, the next one, why? Why is this? Ah, zero substitution. Look at what Parsons says about it. The control region, for example, promotes replication and transcription of mtDNA. So any mutation that interferes with the efficiency of this process might be deleterious and therefore selected against, reducing the apparent mutation rate. So that's why, and even Parsons debunked it. Again, another study, study that should have never been included with mutation rates because they didn't even get results because they were studying an inbred island family that selection was removing mutations from. Another Parsons and Holland came out together this time and they got a uh, fast mutation rate just like he did in his first year. Now another study came along, look at this one. Another one didn't catch any mutations. That's peculiar. Let's find out why though. Ah, oh, I jumped into another one. Um, sorry, I didn't cover that one in this video for some reason. All right, sorry, I threw this together in like an hour or two. So I kind of messed up. But again, you will find the consistency. Anytime you see a mutation rate study that has zero as a result, just go investigate it. If they're all free, you can get them on YouTube real easy. All right, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, on Google. And you will find the consistency in that they were always a related family, all a single people group. Uh, they either tested a small region or a small segment and people were either identical twins or they were related or something like that every single time. This study is funny because it's a more recent one and out of 320 and transmission, we detected 11 substitution. What does that remind you of? That's exactly like Parsons, identical. And this is a more recent one. However, they considered mutations that were probably not going to be passed on. So they reduced it by half because they believe evolution to be true. So they took the actual reality and they removed the reality in favor of evolution, even though this study here claims that what they did was wrong because heteroplastic mutations in their lineages were inherited multiple generations and therefore they sh cannot be somatic. See, they counted, they thought they should have been somatic and should have removed it. Somatic variants are undeniable. Even in the study by, reported by Parsons, which analyzed small pedigrees, a newly arising mutations were detected in multiple family members and thus cannot be somatic. See? So more evolutionary assumption ruins them. They can't think for themselves. Hayer, one of the last studies I'm going to talk about here, tested two regions, got four substitutions after uh, 408, uh, 508. What does this rely to? Look at that. 200 generations ago, 6,600 years for the first region combined with hypervariable region two for 276 generations ago. This study was done only on Europeans. So that means that this would be Noah's sons off the ark when they became the European lineage. So that's Japheth's line. And what does that go to when you multiply it? You, uh, I'm sorry, when you take those two numbers. And, and over and over again, what we see. In a okay, I finished there. So what happens when you take those 220 generations and 275 and you combine those two, you get about 245 generations ago. You land right on Japheth uh, giving birth to his, the European lineage. And that shows you directly looking at both hypervariable full length regions. So we have multiple studies showing that the empirical evidence lands on exactly what we would expect. And any time you get evidence that doesn't align with it, just investigate it and you'll find it has evolutionary assumptions riddled in the study. Well, and, and it's perfect with this video because <clears throat> good old Vice Rhino <laughs> literally admits the assumptions right in the, right in his video. And what's funny is, you know, his, audience since they can't think for themselves lacking critical thinking skills this isn't all atheists or evolutionists you know but definitely his audience they're just going to watch the video it's going to be in one ear and out the other they're going to say oh creation's debunked they're not even going to notice the circular reasoning um but everything you just said there um Brother Matt, you know, I couldn't have said it better than myself. Incredibly detailed. They they can't refute it. They can't refute the mitochondrial DNA. They can't answer the question, you know, vice rhino. 
when you listen to this with a tear rolling down your cheek, you know, answer me the question, why is the mitochondrial DNA sequence, mitochondrial Eve, why is it so unique? It didn't have to be this unique. Yeah, they resort to the hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck, but there was every chance possible that the mitochondrial DNA ancestor could have shared many lines with chimpanzees if we actually share relationship with them. With them. But in fact, what we see is one female ancestor based on the empirical method only goes back a few thousand years. It turns out that all we really find is about 20 to 30 mutations that separate most people in the world today from our Eve ancestor. All of this did not have to be true, but it just turned out to be true. How do they explain such little uh, mutations? It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. That's one of their biggest problems is the mutation rates are fast. There's few fixed differences and they don't align with phylogeny, which is their assumption method, right? So we'll continue on here. DNA is abundant evidence. There isn't enough DNA differences for us in around hundreds of thousands, millions of years. It looks like we arose just 6,000 years ago. That depends entirely on how you calculate the neutral mutation rate. I'm fairly confident that he's referring to the article talking about mitochondrial Eve existing 6,000 years ago based on two studies that found an unusually high mutation rate. No, he's talking about his own study. That's how little this guy knows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, he even he even demonstrated that the new mute, uh, the D loop mutation is consistent. But it's worth anyway mentioning that those studies are outliers. The measured mutation rate is generally about seven times slower than those two studies found. Okay, what he's talking about is the Amish people. Now, when Parsons was doing his study, he noticed that when he looked into the forensic paperwork, he noticed that they were about four times faster than the average. Then he looked at the Am Amish people, and he found that they have a slower rate, about seven times slower. So he didn't just like separate them all out. He combined them all together and said, let's find out what we discovered. So he actually did what you're supposed to do. He took, okay, well, these are way slower and these are a little bit faster. Let's combine them because that's reality, right? Some people groups are going to be slower. Why would the Amish people be slower? Well, they're a small population that intermarry. So what would you find with that problem? Well, guess what? Harmful deleterious mutations from intermarrying would be selected away, wouldn't they? Exactly. That's why they have a slower mutation rate because you can't see the mutations. That's why they're slower. It's not because they are slower. It's because you don't see them. Anyway, let's continue. This was just a study I found recently. 2022, by the way. Anyway, Parsons found that <laughs> way. I'm sorry, what? No, I was just going to say, it doesn't get any better than that, 2020. <laughs> I know, right? And, and now here's the pedigree studies reported, right? They range from zero to 50. Remember, the lowest you can find from that garbage study done here to 50 right. being the highest, right? So uh, they didn't even get 50. Howell got 25 and Parsons got um, 32 and 33, uh, right around there. Um, Howell uh, came back in, in 2003 and got one out of 40 one out of 45, but let's just say 50 is the highest. Grab your calculator, everyone. Let's determine what that is real quick, okay? We go for 24 fixed um, mutations and uh, times uh, 50 and then 1,200. So um, that's, that's how many generations would have occurred at the highest end, 1,200 generations ago, using the highest estimate of observed rates. Let's say that the generation time is, uh, give me a year, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, give me whatever you want, I'll pop, I'll pop it in. Anything? Okay, 25 it is then. That's 30,000 years ago, okay? At the highest estimate, including studies that got zero. So 30,000 years ago is the farthest they can push this back using the, the rates. How does that help evolution? It doesn't. What bottleneck was between now and 30,000 years ago that would reduce all humans to one female? Nothing. That's your answer. Let's keep going. Oh, here we go. There's the chart again. Three da daughters of Noah, right? I, Noah is daughter-in-law. Okay, well, here was the African line. Lots of diversity. They assume lots of time. 
So I made uh, uh, an, a little th illustration here for you at looking at the top. Here's the Q haplo group, which shows the migration from Asia over to North America, looking at Native Americans who migrated down and came into South America. We know that this migration happened at exactly the same time and the, and the South American people got here and they started to diversify. They arose at the same time and they filled up South America. But when we look at the mute substitution differences, we find that some have a lot of more fixed substitutions and some don't. Now, why would that be if this is a, of a, uh, a chart of time? It's not. That's the thing. The chart shows substitutions because they're based on fixation of population size. That's why you find more substitutions here and here in smaller tribes than when you get down to here when the people groups were massive like the Aztecs and Mayans. You're not going to reach fixation in high population groups. So you get little diver uh, you get little substitution fixations. Over here, you get massive amounts of these substitution fixations. So to evolutionists, they see these lines and they go, wow, look at this. They've been here for hundreds of thousands of years longer. That's wrong because we know this chart is only based on the 1000 Genome Project. So it's only looking at differences. That's it. So let's break this down into a little analogy. More like let's imagine a person taking a step. Every single time they take a step up a pyramid, um, they, that's a new mutation, or I'm sorry, a new substitution reaching fixation. So you have to bigger the group, the larger the pyramid, the harder it is to reach the top, to reach fixation. The smaller the people, the faster it is to get to the top of a little pyramid to reach fixation. So there's more differences in smaller people groups and less differences in larger ones. It's not time. That's the evolutionary assumption and genetics destroys them. Let's continue. I might have ended. That might be enough for me. But now I'm skipping a section where they both ramble on. For I love a bit. that analogy there with the pyramid, Matt. I just wanted to point that. Oh, thanks. I wanted to be give give more visuals. Well, I added that to my book too, by the way. Addressing when we come back in is the claim that creationists don't make testable predictions. He said that creationism does make testable predictions, and then didn't provide any examples. And Pause that real quick, Matt. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I guess we did spend, what, uh, 15, 20 minutes there going over the number of testable predictions. I want to point out one thing that's funny. This is like a pure flex interview um, with Dr. Jensen. I think it's like total 30 minutes, 20 minutes maybe, as if he's supposed to give a complete rundown of the extremely technical testable predictions found in replacing Darwin. Like, for example, the predictions on the history of civilization in the Y chromosome mitochondrial DNA. Could you imagine Jensen spending 20 minutes there explaining it to the host? I mean, you know, these are highly technical predictions that possibly even if Vice Rhino were to read through them or I were to explain it to him, he may not even understand them. But it, it, it all it, it comes down to the fact, because we know somatic mutations are not passed on. It, it's that which is, is germ cell line. We can be confident, especially regarding everything you just said, with the corroborating data from all the multiple of independent data sets on mitochondrial DNA mutation rate studies that corroborate that this we do have a germ cell line mutation rate. And Dr. Jensen is so confident that he's making testable predictions that are coming true he's having fantastic results in the y chromosome for example with his history of civilization he's detecting genetic signatures in the mitochondrial dna this is what i find they never address you know they'll just say oh dr jeans is lying so i'm guessing that they just have to say this is coincidence that is predictions and uh, that are flowing from um, the mutation rate and, and his, his work and his research. It's just coincidence that it's working so well. I don't know. I've never actually seen them address it. They seem to just ignore it, especially the history of civilization. Uh, if these DNA differences really do reflect only 4,500 years, we should be able to detect signatures in the Y chromosome, the mitochondrial DNA, and we can. So I don't know. I, I still haven't seen a rebuttal to any of that from any of them, and, and they're free to, to write up, uh, you know, a paper or an article on that, but just saying, oh, he's lying. Well, then you're just saying that his, his predictions are just coincidental and, and lucky. 
I don't know. That that doesn't seem like a good argument to me. But yeah, that's what uh, Dr. Dan was saying in the chat. So I wanted to play devil's advocate there. So okay. I apologize, Matt, just to leave everything, you know, no stone unturned. Go ahead with what you were saying earlier, brother, and I, I won't interrupt. Oh, no problem. Um, I, I was going to say, let's jump into a study that he gave you during a live debate one time. I I liked it. I was like, OK, let's jump over. Now there's something to talk about. Want me to do it? Yeah, brother, I'll, I'll leave it to you on that one. I'll be on mute for a second. Go ahead. OK. Hold on. I got to jump over screen share. Don't know what I'm doing. I guess you can see my screen. Okay. So here's the study up here. I guess I can post it after this. The, the, it's called correcting or purifying selection an improved human mitochondrial clock. Do you notice that even the title is biased, right? Because it says it's correcting purifying selection and it's improving the mitochondrial clock. What's wrong with it? Oh, that's right. It disproves, it disproves evolution. That's the problem with it. So basically the study presumed that long time ago and far away, basically once upon a time, purifying selection was better than it was today and good enough to remove these non-selectable mutations from the coding regions of mtDNA. The study immediately shows its bias in stating that the observed linear clocks we see today are problematic. It says it right here. Why are they problematic? Because these are the actual observed rates right here, starting with how going all the way down, looking at substitution rates and mutation rates of the mitochondria itself. And then here we notice the next problem with the study. Ah, divergent time of human and chimpanzee. What a shocker. Like all typical evolutionary bias mutation rates, they immediately infer that there was a human split. Oh, so right here, essentially evolution to prove evolution. Add in those numbers and poof, you can prove evolution. Here, look, they even admit that they not only used archaeology for dating, but you can see on the line below it that they even assume uh, that the assumption it is based on the assumption. Notice that? Oh, look at that. What a shocker. Here we go again. I'll just leave that there. So I won't sc I'll stop scrolling for people who can read it. How is this not biased? It's not. You're now, the one rebuttal that Dr. Dan would have to this is... I guess once to leave no stone unturned like we've been doing. Okay. And I believe we are demonstrating that we can be confident with a germ cell line mutation and they have to calibrate. There's assumptions, but he'll say that paper involves testing against specific recorded historical events. Okay. Well, that means that that is in recent history. Recent history doesn't include a split from human and chimpanzee. Therefore, you need a mathematical model based on something to start with. And we'll get to that because this article says, and they admit, right. they ha they need a starting point. And their starting point is right here. Right. Seven. It's right there. <laughs> right there. Yeah, that's how I was going to respond too. So yeah, that's good. Keep going, brother. All right. Remember what we say. Anytime you see the word phylogenetic, it's made up trash. That's what we believe because it's assumption based. A model is built to prove its own model. And what do they say in the study? We constructed phylogenetic trees by using the reduced medium algorithm, basically phylogeny. So we use observed, predictable, testable mutation rates. That's it. How many predictions are in the study? Remember, Dan said that they're made, right? Okay, well, guess what? The word was found one time. Here, I'll prove it. Here's the study. Let's type in prediction, shall we? Oh, look at that. One time. Right, right. The, yeah, this was in response to, because I've had so many debates with Erica, with Dr. Stefan Frello, with, I mean, you name it, <clears throat> RJ Downard. And, and I've always asked, okay, fine. You know, uh, actually, most of them don't even really use the arguments of uh, substitution rates, somatic mutations. Typically, they're not up to date enough to use that arguments, but they'll just kind of say, oh, Dr. Jensen's wrong. And that's OK. Well, what kind of testable predictions can you make? And they'll admit that they can't because there's too many assumptions. There's too many inferences. There's too many factors. And I say, OK, well, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's making predictions on the history of civilization. He's making predictions on mutation rates in people groups in Africa, the Khoisan peoples where their mutation rate is not yet known. So Dr. Dan, he's the first whoever um, actually insinuated that, yeah, we've made predictions, we can make predictions. And, and this, this was the prediction. So just to give the background information, what are your thoughts? Is it really a prediction as, as we're, we're, we're looking for there, uh, Brother Matt? No, no, they're using, first of all, this would be a retro diction. They're making a prediction about what the past was like. And it was a prediction by one person who you'll see soon is this guy right here. And he actually pr was trying to predict that uh, 
selection must be weeding out mutations in the past. So that's what they've done. They basically taken this guy's old prediction, which right. I believe was 2005, and they said, oh, we're correcting it using his model of purifying selection to improve the human mitochondria clock. <laughs> it's not a new prediction. It's not on the future. It's not like they can say, well, yeah, it was different in the past and now it's the same, but it'll change are, again and we're going to make a prediction on that. Are they making predictions at, at how effective natural selection and purifying selection has to be? Are they giving numbers? Are they giving, it just sounds like it's a retro prediction. It doesn't, it's, it sounds like they have to assume population sizes. They still have to assume some type of population history, assume natural selection is, is effective enough at, at weeding it out. Like yeah. you said, purify. So I don't see any of those predictions there. I don't know. Do you? No, there's none in the study. Basically what they've done is they've uh, not in this model, but here's what they do. They, they, they take a number and then they believe like, okay, if we, we need to line up this, uh, this, uh, human mutation rate with the phylogeny that, uh, basically the fossil record. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a baseline. Well, Matt, I'm going to stop you right there just to play devil's advocate, because this is a funny one. Uh, and, and we like you, Dr. Dan. Nice guy. We've enjoyed our discussions, but th this was kind of a weak, res weak response, but I'll pretend to be him. Here's his response to everything we're saying. Wait, I'm sorry. So you think selection doesn't exist or doesn't operate or something? How would uh, you respond? Well, yeah, of course it does, but it only selects the most deleterious and harmful mutations to get out. So it leaves the rest, and that's what we're counting to make mutation rate clock. We're leaving the, the amount that is unselectable and that is building up, and that's the mutation rate. Right. Camorasol, Camorasol building up and selection couldn't remove it. And we go, oh, well, how many is there? Oh, there's about an average of about 100. Okay, well, let's do the math. How often does that build up? And that's why we say, okay, natural selection did it, you know, or they can look to substitution rates or, you know, they've got a number of explanations or some will say that, um, you know, time dependency, that it's slowed down in the past and then it's not quite as consistent as we think. Sure. Make the testable predictions that are future, not retro predictions like this. We agree natural selection works, but based on how fast the mitochondrial DNA is, Matt, we say this all the time. I said this to Guts and Given without like a real rebuttal. I said, there's no mutation rate slow enough and there's no um, type of selection effective enough to account for deep time evolution regarding the mitochondrial DNA, regarding the, the Y chromosome. That's why... Testable predictions are so important. Nobody denies these things, but it's not going to help you. Even if there were a few, um, even if you gave them the benefit of the doubt with heteroplasmy and with somatic cell line mutations, it's, it's still not going to help. I mean, they need to invoke mutation rates 20 times faster than, than is observed. They need to invoke um, selection status much more effective than we see in the present. You know, they can come up with any ad hoc rescue device they want, but if there's no testable predictions that flow from it, then um, then it's pseudoscience. And they'll say, oh, you know, Dr. Jeanson's prediction, you know, where's his paper on the Khoisan people? Okay, let's get the plug, let's get the DNA, let, let's find out if it's true. But guess what? They never comment on the fascinating results found in the Y chromosome regarding the history of civilization. They never comment on the genetic signatures found in the mitochondrial DNA. I've mm -hmm. yet to see anything. i am yet to see any response to that. And anytime I say, hey, look, you know, Dr. Jensen is incredibly detailed in his, it's gotta be a 23 or 24 part series on the history of civilization, detecting these signatures using um, population sizes, population genetics um, and other factors. But, the thing is, if these DNA differences, like we said before, only go back 4,500 years, then these, these historical events should hypothetically be detected. But if deep time evolution is true, okay, and humans evolved, you know, slowly over time from the Australopithecines, eventually Homo erectus, eventually Homo sapiens, and the out of Africa story is true. Well, then the last 4,500 years is, is nothing, you got a needle, that actually, that 4,500 years is just the, the very little tip. It's so insignificant compared to the rest of evolutionary history. Therefore, it should be nothing but a scrambled mess. You can't detect any signatures, but he is detecting signatures. So either he's lying or he's lucky. That's your only two options, you know, for them. But for us, no, the predictions are working because the model is accurate.
And that's how you do science. So uh, go ahead, Matt. I just wanted to point that out. And it's, and it's not just working in humans. You've got to realize they've done pedigree studies on multiple animals, and they've never found a creature alive that was unable to say, like, wow, these mutation rates aren't building up. Maybe selection's more powerful in this creature or more powerful in that one. The mutation rate clocks all show the consistency. And that's what Jensen said. I'll challenge anybody. Let's go out, pick an animal, a fox, whatever, and make your prediction on it. I'll make mine. We'll see which one is true. Right. Right. You, know, you got it. Well, and, and I, and you know, typically we did this response video after I had a couple of discussions with, um, I mean, we probably talked at least with our two, uh, hangouts, Dr. Dan and I probably discussed mutation rates in Jansen for well over an hour. So we've touched on all this. So that's why, you know, I felt, okay, now's a decent time to, you know, cause I, I like to give them the, you know, the chance to, to defend themselves, I guess, and, and provide their objection. So I said this to him a couple of times. I said, okay, you know, for one, if Jensen's uh, studies, you know, if, if there's so many glaring omissions, like he's saying, why are they working so well? That's one. I also said to him, since Dr. Jensen has gone through multiple other species mutation rates, and the answer is always the same across multiple independent data sets, data sets, then he is safe to assume we are looking at germline. And I went over like the yeast and the fruit fly and whatever, you know, I don't want to rehash everything. And, um, you know, his response was um, insufficient because they all corroborate on each other. That's the thing, you know, it's independent data sets that are corroborating on one key conclusion. And boom, testable predictions are flowing from it. So, um, yeah, uh, go ahead, Matt. Continue, brother. Okay, we'll jump back into it before uh, I get too sidetracked. Because every time you say something, I'm like, oh, yeah, we could talk about mutation rate saturation of mitochondria or something. And guess what? There's It hasn't reached it. So why would that be true? If deep time evolution is true, there's a saturation limit that jumps right in there. Even um, rational mind was like, yeah, that I guess that should have happened. And then he just moved on. <laughs> anyway. Here we go. I said, uh, notice that nothing in the study was proven or even remotely verified. It was alluded to and considered likely at best. You can see the, their wording. Notice the language, most plausible, meaning without evidence. These people cannot read between the lines. They, they like you say, they hope they dream and they imagine, but that's what they do. Uh, here we go. No predictions were made at all in the study. Basically, they formulated a new way to manipulate mutation rates and to fix the timeline to their myth and then said it matched an older prediction of the past by Cavillicid, Kavil I can't pronounce it, in 2005. He's the one that's, that said he believed that deep because deep time was true, selection must have removed mutations in the past, but probably not today. Oh, what a surprise there. Who, who's heard that before? Therefore, the observed clocks can be undermined. See what he's doing? He It doesn't line up with evolution, and therefore it must be wrong. So there has to be some explanation for it. So they use this guy to invoke that. It's the typical ad hoc rescue device we often get. Here's the real question for them. That's what I posed earlier. Why all do all of these things show that? So the pathetic rescue device is that, well, maybe it was different in the past, which undermines the rest of their model, because if everything else is consistent in the past, then how could they say that this was different in the past? You can't use that as a rescuing device. Anyway, uh, what made them say it was likely that purifying selection removed near neutral mutations, which clocks are built off of? Even the study admits it. Look, what did they say? The virtual linear relationship between the accumulation of synonymous mutations and the control region mutations suggests that the control region cannot be greatly affected by purifying selection. So they say it can't be weeded out by purifying selection because it's not affected by it. Why is it not affected by it? Because it can't see it. It's that simple. Interesting, is it not that mutation accumulation is hardly affected at all by pur purifying selection? Just like this. Sorry, I wasn't here reading. So, um, I uh, I just write what I think sometimes, so I'm repeating myself because I'm just thinking out loud. So again, the exact opposite of what they are claiming in the very study to be true. This is why they invoke that maybe saturation of the control region for mutations must have happened in the past and then it got weeded out. But that way they can try to invoke that the mutation rate was again discounted entirely in favor of phylogeny rates, which they need to be true. But here's the problem. Deep down, they know that saturation cannot provide the major explanations for increase in the ratios of synonymous, synonymous mutations in the mtDNA trees or higher ages. So they invoke purifying selection as their rescuing device for that, which is why they mentioned, 
I really need to learn how to pronounce this guy's name, Kivislid. In the study, that is what they proposed must be the case. Basically, the gradual continuous removal of lineage lineages containing weakly deleterious mutations in other classes through purifying selection. So now you see, and everyone else can see, this is why they invoke purifying selection with the probability of the D-loop saturation. This is why the study in, is called the improved molecular clock, because they believe that there is, they have two rescue devices now that can prove phylogeny. So instead of one rescuing devices, they linked two of them and then wrote a whole study on it. Isn't that real science? Anyway, the study admits because we do not know how far back in time the tree ceases to be effective under selection, these weak deleterious mutations will, will be a proportion of the overall diversity despite becoming progressively more negligible moving further back in the tree. So again, they add the human Neanderthal split as an assumption, here they state it, and then they jump back to the human evolution ape split. So there you go again, evolution to prove evolution. How can they even, uh, here they, you can see that they admit again, several assumptions are necessary. Wait, I thought you said that they didn't need a starting assumption to begin with. You absolutely do when you're gonna have a, a mutation rate. And now you can see with your very own eyes there, correct. They have removed the observational rate in exchange for a fantasy, a hypothetical human divergent of the past, a model built to prove a model, using evolution to prove evolution and all to obtain the results desired. They invented a population required to make a clockwork. It's called bootstrapping. And then that's what they've done here by correcting the observed overall. What do you mean correcting? It didn't need it. It's so good that the FBI are still using it. Anyway, here they have to say that the numbers would uh, be even better if, wait a minute, where's that if coming from? See, the study spends the majority of its time looking at branches of macro uh, haplogroups, the M, N, and R, which again, Neanderthal in date. Uh, so they're looking at these things to obtain a date so they can go off so they can make their time dependent clock. This way they can assume a mutation rate that they need to match their evolutionary tree. Look, assuming an overall intrinsic mutation rate of the past. Ah, assumption again. How can they honestly invoke purifying selection when the study even admits that purifying selection doesn't even act on it? That's what confuses me. Take away the evolutionary assumption the entire study wouldn't even exist. This entire thing is garbage without evolution ex already existing as their base study. It is filled with nothing but estimates and guesses and hypotheticals and assumptions. If you type control F and look up the word estimate, it is used 122 times. Look at it. Well, that's the wrong one. What the heck? Look at that. Insane estimate. Anyway. So they they they're stating how many times is assumption used? Look at this. And remember, this is the best one they got apparently. <laughs> yeah, this is, the best, this is what debunks this. Here's this is what kills that creation right here. This study, the assumption model. You will notice that in the study, they need a calibration point to even make a mutation rate possible. You notice that? How is that? So do you see? They need to admit that there is a starting point for their model to even work, which is a pure assumption model to prove of evotarsis. Take away that, and you have the observed rates. Add in the assumptions, and you get studies like this, evolution proving evolution. Anything can be done when you use a theory to prove its own theory. What is this? Uh, look, if it doesn't say at all, I don't know. Implications of the finding of the mutation rate is approximately consistent with lower ages in that some of the issues that have arisen concerning deep time dependency of the control region of molecular clocks are likely caused by problematic data sets by suggested by an evolutionist. What a shocker. <laughs> so the evidence doesn't line up to evolution. So therefore it's problematic and wrong. Nice. Uh, so that's wrong because it is correct. It's in correcting data to interpret is what's going on. It's summed up with damn cannot see because he doesn't want to believe it. And when we go right here, we see when the recalibration of the M the clock by accounting for the effects of deep time. What? Deep time? Oh, you don't account for deep time? You don't make the clock? What a shocker again. Man, the study really admitting a lot about itself, isn't it? The very thing he is setting the study does not do, the very study says it does do. And it says it makes assumptions over and over again. He says that it makes predictions. It does not. He says it solves the riddles of mutations for building up. It does not. It gives rescue devices 
but the study in no way does anything more than answer the riddle of what Kondrashov has been after the entire time, invoking assumptions. The study even admits that removing mutation rates, they found that were too fast in particular, right here, I guess I could read it, we, can, we excluded mutation rates at this position because the mutation rates at this side were so disproportionately fast in comparison to the rest of the mutation rate. So when they, here's my prediction, here's what I say. So even when they found the mutation rate was fast in this region, they discounted it and ignored it. Why? I promise you that if that region was slow, they would have immediately counted it as evidence. This again shows you the bias that these people are under and how blindly they want to look at it. So the study is ripe with biased evolutionary assumptions and it stands out like a sore thumb. How can any honest person that's open-minded look and read these things and have another and know that there's another perspective like ours and then recognize that it that oh man like okay well I know that there's another view I can look at but I'm not going to look at it at all because all I see is evolution is true so the motives behind Dan are that evolution is true it seems like either he's so indoctrinated that he can't see it and he only sees through the lens of evolution and he can't comprehend that we our model is actually what it's trying to say but he's like Erica and R and Raw that's what I think I think that he doesn't even want to see it I think that he can't even see it because if no he can't. This well, because he's using the same arguments in the chat that he's used before that we've already responded to. So, and and well, yeah, keep, go. keep going, yeah, keep going, brother. No, no, that's I, that's all I'm saying is like literally, if he can st stand back and and see that we state this and that it must be not true because of this when we've explained it multiple times, right? I don't get it. I I just don't. I mean, how many times does a study say assumption? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And and. and, and and where's the future novel prediction that we were asking for? I I, I don't see it. I see assu assumptions, conjecture, storyboard, as Brother Neff always points out, storyboard. And, and Neff, great paper, the Y chromosome. 70% dissimilar between chimps and humans and evolved through gene loss. Devolving equals evolving. So <laughs> Brother Neff was pointing that out in the chat. He's so right. Nice. Well, I just wanted to show you guys because literally that everything was amazing. told you in that debate is wrong. Everything, everything he said, the study said, it doesn't say. So in the story, I'm done. Well, yeah, that was an amazing, amazing um, write up to that paper. Incredibly detailed. Anybody interested in it, we'll, we'll send it to them. Oh, good. Here, yeah. I'll put it right there now. Actually. And remember, this is proof, okay? Because after how many debates with some of their so called best, you know, asking them, hearing every rescue device in the book and asking them what testable prediction can you make? And they admit they can't. And now Dr. Dan comes with this. Obviously he's seen those debates and thought, oh, okay, I'll show them up. Gives this prediction. I, I um, you know, I, I stated, I predict that that paper is not what you say it was. And there you go. Another confirmed testable prediction by a creationist because it wasn't. Mm -hmm.